All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our next lecture uh, in our series on uh, energy conservation and the work energy theorem. Now, normally, this is going to be a bit of a uh, kind of a non standard lecture. You know, normally, uh, this lecture would be spending some more time uh, immersing ourselves in the language of work, the connection between work and energy, but unfortunately the studio for this lecture is very, very equipment heavy. Uh, we'd be having you go in and working with a launcher uh, for about two hours and understanding its behavior in the context of the work energy theorem, and it just didn't translate uh, online as well. But what a lot of students really want out of the uh, conversation that we're having here on the perceptions of energy, using energy to understand motion is just more practice and familiarity with the conservation of energy equation, how it applies in various different contexts and so on and so forth. So this is going to be then uh, our, if you like, uh, lecture 16.5 is we're going to spend some time uh, today in lecture. You're going to spend lots more time in studio. We are just going to practice energy conservation problems. So I have six problems here in lecture that we are going to go to, to uh, go through together. We're going to focus very heavily on the procedure for how to understand these in the, excuse me, in the context of conservation of energy and how to set these up. So this is um, defining what the system is, whether things are going to appear as um, external work or internal potential energies. Um, and in fact, I have a seventh problem kind of, uh, I've been uh, stewing over a little bit off the top of my head that uh, we might go through if we have some time. And then you will just see more of this uh, in studio. When you get to studio, you'll have another, about five or six problems, um, various different contexts that you will solve in, the con uh, uh, in using uh, conservation of energy and the work energy theorem, hopefully to prep you a little bit for uh, the upcoming exam. So this is our big theme for this lecture. We spent the last two talking about the setup, the work energy theorem. We spent the last lecture talking about potential energies and the idea that certain forces, we refer, uh, refer to these as conservative forces, can either be written as doing external work or as providing internal potential energies. Now, you'll notice when I go through these problems today um, that for the most part, I'm going to be in the second domain. I'm going to treat these uh, conservative forces as sitting uh, in and providing potential energies. And the only things that are going to be doing external work are going to be the non-conservative things. So you're going to see friction. Uh, you'll see some water uh, today that is doing, uh, going to be doing some external work. Uh, one of my favorite problems involves uh, braking systems on roller coasters. I'll present that to you, and uh, that will do uh, some external work as well. So we'll focus very heavily on setting these problems up, and I hope that you will see, uh, after we've gone through these six or seven problems here in this lecture, that the procedure, this, the problem-solving method for understanding these questions in the context of energy is really the same. Uh, you, you always use the same equation, you always set it up the same way, and you just plug in different terms depending on um, where the energies are currently in the context of the system as you have defined it. Okay, so let's just jump right in. Again, I want to focus very heavily on procedure and setup for these uh, energy conservation problems. And you saw a little bit of this in the last lecture, but we didn't really uh, sort of formally set up everything that you need to solve these problems with energy. So I have a slide really quick here where every time that you go through and you solve a problem using the conservation of energy or using the work energy theorem, you should be going through each of these steps. And again, I hope that you'll notice after we solve these couple of problems here in lecture, after you solve a few more problems in the studio environment, that uh, these steps will start to become very, very rote. Um, and you'll be able to go through the first four, even the first five, very, very, very quickly, because it's going to be, again, just the same setup for every single problem. This is why I love uh, this energy approach, is it's the same sort of schema, and then you just plug in different things in the conservation of energy equation, depending on where the energies are appearing at some given points in time. So as a reminder, and I'm going to do each of these for every problem that we solve here today uh, to make sure that you get some practice. So as a reminder, we always start uh, physics problems by drawing a picture of the question and defining a coordinate system. You'll find that the definition of the coordinate system is not mm, as imperative in energy as it is for forces, but we'll find a couple situations where in energy problems, forces will be doing work or we'll need to define um, in what direction something is accelerating with respect to the way that gravity is pointing. So it's just a good practice to um, 
define our coordinate system. Now, you remember from the last lecture on potential energies, the next thing we will do is define a system. And remember, a system is the set of objects that we are going to say or will be carrying the energies under study within the system. All right. Usually this is going to be the earth plus whatever other objects are in motion. And again, we'll give you some more practice with this. But remember, whatever object goes in the system provides energy to the system, which means if you put a conservative force in the system, this is uh, earth, this is the spring, for instance, they will provide potential energies instead of doing external work. And that's the context that I'm gonna sit in here today. I'm gonna to have these things uh, providing potential energies and leaving the non-conservative forces to do work. We start the problem again by defining where I want my gravitational potential energy to be zero. Again, I have lots of different problems here today. I'll give you a couple of different definitions for where to set that zero point. Uh, again, I've put in, uh, if you like, my 10,000 hours into physics, so I have a pretty good sense for where um, good zero points are. And I'll give you some suggestions as we go through today that will help you when you get into the studio environment. Uh, next, we set up the statement of conservation of energy, and we define the initial and final states, because remember, the energy approach doesn't care how you got from one point to the other. All it cares about is where you started, where you finished, and whether or not there was any non-conservative work being done on the way. So this is why I say define initial and final states, because the conservation of energy only cares about how the energy changes from initial to final. And it'll give you lots of examples as we go through. After we define our initial and final uh, states, we'll fill in our equation of conservation of energy. We'll look at those two different states, initial and final, and we will say, where are all the forms of energy here? Where are all the forms of energy here? That will help us fill in this equation. And then usually, the problem will set you up such that you will just have one equation, the conservation of energy equation and one unknown, usually a speed or a height uh, or something like that. Sometimes, and I'll give you an example problem here today, uh, you may need to appeal to another solution method. So I've prepared a problem uh, with some colliding boxes. Uh, to understand the nature of that behavior, we are going to have to use the conservation of momentum. You will find when you get into studio um, that we have designed a problem specifically that will require you to use Newton's laws in addition to conservation of energy. So the energy will be the sort of main problem solving piece, but to get to the very last part of the question, you will use information from conservation of energy in the form of Newton's laws. All right, so let's just jump right in. Um, so what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to present you the problem. What I'd like you to do is for all these questions, again, I have six. Um, if I have time, I may present a seventh uh, sort of off the top of my head. For each of these questions, go ahead and write them down because what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint and I'm going to go over to my webcam that's sitting here facing downwards and I'm going to solve the problems uh, on paper the same way that I'd like you to be solving them as well. So make sure you write the problem down because I'm going to stop uh, my screen share and I'm going to move over uh, to my webcam to solve them. So make sure you write down all the pertinent information. Pause the video after you write the problem down. Try out those first four or five steps uh, within our energy conservation uh, problem solving and, and setting up the question, defining the system, where are the initial final states, so on and so forth. When you set up the, finish setting up the problem and done those first uh, four or five setup steps, if you'd like to go on to attempt a solution, that is perfectly fine. Otherwise, when you're ready to see uh, my approach to the question, go ahead and resume the video. All right, so as you'll find, as we go through a couple of these questions uh, here today, I am a very big uh, theme park fanatic. Um, I am very much uh, appreciative that Carowinds is just a few hours down the road. Kings Dominion is just a few hours down the road. Uh, a little bit unfortunate that the current um, global state of affairs is pre uh, preventing me from uh, doing any of those. In fact, I would probably be there uh, right now uh, enjoying uh, some of this physics if it weren't for um, the unfortunate nature of COVID. But um, alas, what can we do? And instead of this, I will present you some uh, example problems on theme parks that will hopefully uh, get us into the mood a little bit with actually, without actually having to be there. So this is one of my favorites. Here's the idea. 
Uh, this is going to be a roller coaster that is going to go through a couple of different hills, uh, one of which is 75 meters tall, the other which is 30 meters tall. Uh, between the 75 and the 30 meter hill, uh, the roller coaster is going to pass through a braking system that is going to supply a constant force over a 30 meter distance. And this is usually what they need to do when they construct roller coasters is in the second half of the tracks, uh, the roller coasters are typically moving a little bit too quickly uh, to make some of those turns. So they usually put in uh, braking systems about halfway through the ride uh, to forcibly slow you down just a little bit so you can make uh, the final uh, couple of turns and not experience too many g-forces. So the question is, is here, and again through all of these, we're going to use conservation of energy to solve them. So the first question is what is the speed of the roller coaster at the top of the first hill? And then our second question is after the roller coaster passes through this braking system, what is going to be the speed at the top of the second hill? All right, now I'll warn you a little bit in advance, um, I haven't actually uh, attempted the solutions uh, to any of these problems. I just kind of pulled numbers out of the air, so I hope they work out. Uh, if not, we'll just fiddle with the numbers and we'll make it work out. Really the, the big and the big kind of thing here is the, uh, what is the procedure and the solution method that we're going to go through here. Okay, make sure you have this problem copied down, so I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna move over to my webcam here and we'll solve the problem together. Okay, so here we are. And again, um, I, I could just present these on PowerPoints, but I really prefer to uh, write things down. It just makes me, uh, makes me feel like I'm you know, actually doing physics, I suppose. So I'm gonna do these solutions by hand. So here we go, what's our first step? We draw a picture, we define a coordinate system. So uh, again, do please um, forgive my, uh, shall we say, lack of artistic ability. I am, of course, uh, uh, a physicist. So this is not something that, uh, I have much of an acumen for, but alas. So let's draw out a quick little roller coaster here. So I got a roller coaster. It's gonna go through one first big loop here. Then it's gonna go across a patch of friction. So I'll just draw in some friction here. Then it's gonna go through a second smaller loop. And then it's gonna go on and do its thing. We don't really care uh, about the, the rest of it. So here's my picture. Let's see, I'll define a couple of things. So we know the height of this guy. This is a 100 meter hill to start us out. The second hill was 75 meters, and then what was the height of the third hill? We had a 30 meter hill. Obviously not to scale. Okay, what else do we know? We're told the roller coaster starts at rest, so I'll just write in that the initial velocity of the roller coaster is zero. It's going to help us out. And what does the problem want us to find? Uh, let's see. Speed at the top of the first and second hills, assuming that this frictional pack, uh, patch here is applying a constant uh, 50 Newton force. Okay, so I drew a picture. Uh, what else do I need to do? I need to define a coordinate system. So I'm just going to do that here. And you'll find as we go through this that you know, we're really not going to do anything special uh, with the coordinate system. Uh, for the most part, when you deal with energy, the standard sort of X and Y uh, coordinate system perfectly well applies uh, in the context of these problems. Okay, draw my picture. I drew my coordinate system. What is next? We need to define the system. So I'm going to define the system here. Again, the system is the things uh, that carry the energy in the question. So I'm going to define this as the roller coaster will be part of my system. And I want um, the Earth's force to appear as potential energy instead of work. So I'm going to add the gravitational force. I'm going to add Earth as part of the system. So it's going to uh, present potential energy instead of doing external work. Okay, still going through all the steps. Let's define where gravitational potential energy is zero. Uh, usually, with problems like this, don't do anything special. Um, so if, if the problem has you know, a ground, define that point as potential energy equals zero. So I'm gonna do that here. I'm gonna define this point, make it a dotted line. And this is going to be my height equals zero. So height equals zero, of course, also corresponds to any object will have zero gravitational potential energy if it is at this point. Okay, what is next? Set up conservation of energy equation. So the way I like to set it up is um, energy final equals energy initial plus any external work. That is done. Um, here we are gonna have some external work uh, because there is a friction patch but we're only gonna to have to worry about it between two instances. And I will show you uh, what I mean. So we're just gonna start by setting this up. 
Next, we define initial and final states, but the problem is asking two pieces. It's asking what is the speed up here at the top of the second hill, and what is the speed up here at the top of the first hill. All right, so I'm gonna define, I'm gonna go ahead and say that my initial state is all the way over here. It's all the way at the top of the first hill. And I define this to be my initial state, again, a little bit a priori because I know it's gonna work out nicely, but more to the point, I define this as my initial state because the velocity of the roller coaster is zero at that point. If the velocity of the roller coaster is zero at this point, it means that the roller coaster does not have any kinetic energy at that point. And that's gonna help us simplify our conservation of energy equation when we get there. So I'm gonna define this as, the, as my initial point. The question wants the speed at the top of the first hill. So I'm gonna define this as my first final point. I'll just call it final one. It also asks me for the speed at the top of the second hill. I'll define this as my second final point call it final two. Notice I'm going to use the same initial point through the entire problem. All right, and this is one of the big points of uh, using a conservation of energy approach is that um, as long as your final state is the point at which you're looking to measure something, in this case, what is the speed there, the initial state doesn't matter. You could pick it wherever you want it to be. So this is an instance where I'm going to pick this initial state and I'm going to keep this the same for the entire question even though we're gonna be solving it in two different parts. Okay, let's start with the first part here, which is what is the speed at the top of this hill? So let's go through each of these. So we get energy final, that's an F. Energy final equals energy initial plus work external. But remember, the energies can come in two forms. They can come in kinetic or potential. So I'm just gonna write down that both possibilities exist. So I'll have kinetic final plus, oops, excuse me, potential final equals kinetic initial plus potential initial plus any external work that is done. And specifically speaking, this is any external work that is done between the initial and the final states during that motion. Sorry about that. This is a U, potential final. Okay, so now what we do is we just go through each of these pieces and check it um, for our initial and final states. Let's start with the initial state. Let's go all the way up here. All right. So first, let's check. Does the roller coaster have any kinetic energy at the initial point? No, it doesn't, because we picked the initial point specifically such that the velocity is zero. So this term drops out. It immediately becomes zero. All right, piece of cake. Is there any potential energy when the roller coaster is at its initial point? Well, yes, there is, because we've defined the ground to be the zero point. So if the roller coaster is above the ground, it's just placed 100 meters above the ground, it is going to have potential energy. So I'm gonna write this down as M, G, and my initial height above wherever I have defined as H equals zero. Now, are there any other potential energy terms? Well, really the only other thing that can provide potential energy in these questions is um, springs. So you can really just ask, are there any springs? In the initial state, no, there aren't. So this is the only term that we need for my initial potential energy. Now let's check this one here. Is there any external work that is done as the roller coaster moves from initial to final? And remember, really the only external work that's going to come in here is work that's being done due to non-conservative forces like friction or air resistance or water resistance or so on and so forth. So is there any friction between the initial and the final state? Well, no, your friction doesn't appear until here. So there's no friction between initial and final. We're ignoring air resistance, because for the most part, we always do for our problems between initial and final. So this means, again, because I've chosen the Earth to be part of the system and providing a potential energy, there is no external work between these initial and final states that I've chosen. Okay. So now let's move on to the final state. Is there kinetic energy in the final state? Well, yes, there is. The roller coaster is going to be moving around this hill, so it is going to have some kinetic energy. And recall, it looks like one half mv squared. Uh, will the roller coaster in its final position have potential energy? Well, yes, it will, because the roller coaster is a distance above the line that we have defined as h equals zero. So it is 
going to have some potential energy, but it's a different height this time. We're going to call it um, H final as opposed to H initial. All right. So I've checked my initial and final states. I have um, expressed my conservation of energy equation correctly. So now the only thing I need to do is solve for what I'm looking for. And the question says, what is the speed at the top of that hill? All right. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of manipulation first. I'm going to move this term uh, to the other side. So that gives me 1 half mv squared equals mg times h initial minus h final. Uh, I have all the numbers for this. I know the mass of the roller coaster. I know g. I know the difference in the heights. Let's see, it was 100 versus a 75. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug the numbers in at this point. Uh, let's see, getting my guy a calculator out. I've got a 100 kilogram mass roller coaster times 9.8 times the difference in the heights, which is 25 meters. Let's see, and double check me here. I find 24,500 joules. All right, uh, I really need the speed V. So let's see, what do I need to do here? This means that V is going to be the square root of two times 24,500 joules divided by the mass. Take the square root of the whole thing. Don't forget, very important uh, to take these square roots. And let's see what I find. I'm going to plug it in times two uh, divided by the mass. What was the mass? This is a 100 kilogram roller coaster. And then I take the square root of my final answer. And I find it's moving at 22.1 meters per second. All right, that's pretty darn quick, actually. Uh, again, this is my, uh, my fault for not checking the numbers. So 22.1 meters per second, pretty fast. It's like, what, about 40 miles an hour? Um, well, I guess it's not too quick uh, for roller coasters. You know, some of those roller coasters can reach uh, 70, 80 miles per hour, something like that. So that's not too um, onerous, I suppose. Okay, let's move on to part B. I have to get a separate sheet of paper here. That's all right, I have it right next to me. Okay, part B said, uh, what was the speed at the top of the second hill? All right, I'm gonna keep my same initial point because I'm free to find the initial point wherever the hell I want to, so I just, why not just keep it the same? So let's do the same procedure. I'm gonna set up my conservation of energy equation. Kinetic final plus potential final equals kinetic initial plus potential initial plus any external work. And this time we are gonna have some external work that we're going to need to track. Okay, next piece of paper. Okay, let's check these points. Uh, let's see, the initial point is exactly the same as we solved in part A. So since the initial point is the same as we solved in part A, its expression of its energies is also the same for part A. So I can go ahead and fill that in. So I know there's no kinetic for the initial, uh, kinetic energy, and the potential energy is just going to work out to mg times h, just as it did before. And this here is the advantage of keeping the same initial point as we did in the previous section, as we did in part a. So now we can use the same result that I got for part a because it's the same uh, initial point as I had before. Okay, this piece is done and there are no springs, so no other potential uh, spring energy to worry about. Next is external work. So is there external work done between the initial and the final point? Well, yes, there is, because the roller coaster is passing through this patch of friction, and that friction is doing work on that roller coaster. So now there is going to be external work. Recall that work is force dotted into the displacement. So here, the displacement of the roller coaster is to the right, but the friction force acting on it is to the left. If force and displacement are in opposite directions, this means that the work done is negative by definition. So our work term must have a minus sign, and it's going to be the strength of the force times the distance over which it acts. Again, this is the definition of work, is force times distance. And we're given both of these, so we'll be able to plug in numbers, which is excellent. All right, let's look at our final configuration. Where was the final for part uh, for the second part. Well, the final point is all the way over here. So now we ask our questions once again. 
Will the roller coaster be moving at this point? Yes, it will, so it will have kinetic energy. Will the roller coaster have gravitational potential energy at this point? You bet it will, because this point we have defined as h equals zero, and this final point where the roller coaster is now located is a distance above. In fact, it's 30 meters above that point. So it is going to have potential energy. So let's go back to our problem solve here. So it is going to have some kinetic energy. Don't get it confused uh, with the velocity you solved previously. Um, so I'll call it V2 to indicate this is for the second part of the problem. And we are going to have some gravitational potential. And again, I'll call it height uh, F2 to indicate that it is a different uh, vertical height. But of course, the initial height is the same. So we'll leave that as being the same. OK, so at this point, I finished setting up my conservation of energy equation. What is the problem asking us to find? Well, it's asking us to find this piece right here. So I'm going to do again, I'm running out of space here, that's all right. I'm going to do again a little bit of algebra before I start plugging in numbers. I'm going to move this over to the other side of the equation. So I'm going to get 1 half m v2 squared equals mg times the initial height minus the second final height. And then we still need to remember to subtract off the work done by the friction force, which is the force of friction times the displacement. OK, now let's start plugging numbers into our calculator. Uh, I know the mass. I know the difference in the heights. It's going to be, I think, uh, was a 100 meter height and a 30 meter height. Let's see, let me double check here. This was a 50 Newton friction force that was acting over a 30 meter distance. So let's put some things in here and see what we get. All right, let's see. Mass of the roller coaster is 100. Pretty light for a roller coaster, but I just wanted to pick some uh, nice round numbers times the difference in the heights. And then I'll subtract off the work done by friction. And again, check me here. Uh, I find, let's see, 100 minus 30. This is going to be 67,100 joules of energy. Again, I can use joules here because my mass is in kilograms, the height is in meters, and so on and so forth. OK, finish the problem here. Looking for the velocity, v2. This is going to be the square root of 2 times that value, 67,100 joules, and then divided by, as before, the mass of the roller coaster. And let's see what we find. This is going to be way faster. Uh, times 2 divided by the mass, 100. Take the square root. Of the final answer, well, it's not too much faster. We find here at the top of the second loop, it's 36.6 uh, meters per second. So I hope this gives you a, a sense for uh, sort of why that breaking force is needed. Because uh, if it wasn't, this would be significantly higher. So it'd be more like 40, 42, 44 meters per second. And that might be pushing uh, some of the limits of the roller coaster. So we, before we move on to the next question, I again want you to kind of glance through this because these steps that we went through here are really going to be identical for every energy problem. Note, you know, keeping the initial point the same means the initial expressions of the energies are the same. But then note that, you know, despite the fact that this roller coaster is going through this really crazy motion, you know, diving down, going through a loop, uh, passing through a braking system, going through another loop, we don't really care about the nature of that motion because the energy conservation, as long as there's no work being done, uh, energy conservation only cares about where you start and where you finish. And when you set up your equations, you only need to deal with where you start and where you finish. All right? So I'll leave that up for just a second while I go back to my screen, uh, screen share. If you'd like to copy that down, that's perfectly fine. And we'll move on to the next question. All right. Very nicely done on that one. Let's see, put these off to the side, fresh piece of paper. All right, next question, what was next? I actually don't remember. Let's see, oh, the skydiver in trouble. All right, here we go. So as before, read through this question, draw it out, uh, work through the first couple of steps, uh, the first couple of setup steps for yourself. When you are ready to work through the question, uh, re resume the video and we'll solve the question together. All right, let's see here. A little bit of a typo, sorry about that. So I have a skydiver 
He's going to open his parachute 300 meters above the ground, moving at 30 meters per second. Um, but he didn't check his parachute uh, before launching. So the parachute is only going to supply uh, 100 newtons of resistance as he falls. So the first question is um, uh, rather unfortunate, which is how fast is he going to hit the ground? All right. So let's go through all our steps here once again. Set up the problem, draw a picture. Let's see. Here's the ground. Here's my unfortunate skydiver. And he is sad uh, because he's skydiving with a broken parachute. Uh, let's see. He was a certain height above the ground. And at this height, he is moving at 30 meters per second. All right. Uh, let's see. Was there anything else that we needed for setup? Let's see. Oh yes, the parachute. So the parachute's going to supply, let's draw this in here. Not very much, uh, only 100 Newtons of force. Uh, so a uh, particularly holy parachute, as it turns out. Okay, good looking picture. Finish setting up our coordinate system, X and Y. Uh, let's see, we'll define the initial and final states. So I will say the initial state is up here, right when he opens the parachute. And the final state will be down here when he hits the ground. All right. Uh, let's see. Let me double check the steps here. Did we do everything? Let's see. We, um, oh, we still need to define the system. All right. I'm going to have the system be the person and the earth. Again, I put the earth uh, in the system because I want to describe the work that the Earth is doing in terms of potential energy as opposed to doing external work. All right, last but not least, we need to define uh, where is potential energy going to equal zero. Again, not going to do anything special here. Let's just call the ground my zero point for potential energy. All right, off we go. We're going to set up our conservation of energy equation. Energy final equals energy initial plus any external work that is done. Uh, I'm gonna write these in terms of the different forms of energy that can appear. So we'll have kinetic final plus potential final equals kinetic initial plus potential initial plus any external work that is being done. Okay, now I've defined my initial and final states. So let's go through and let's check each of these five terms. Um, to see if there's a form of energy that needs to appear there. So let's start actually with the final state. Uh, will the skydiver be moving at the final state? Well, yes, because the final state is, if you like, the instant that he hits the ground. He's moving very fast when he hits the ground. So I do need a kinetic term. It's going to be 1 half m v final squared. All right. Will the skydiver have gravitational potential energy when he hits the ground? Well, in this case, no, he won't, because I have defined that I want the ground to be zero with respect to gravitational potential energy. So the skydiver does not have any potential. Again, because we're also ignoring that there are springs. Um, in the next problem, or in the second half of this problem, I will introduce a trampoline, and we will have a spring force to consider. But for now, he's just going to smack into the ground. No gravitational potential there. Okay, let's now check the initial points equals. Um, is the skydiver moving at the initial point? Well, yes, he is, because he's moving at 30 meters per second, so he will have some initial uh, kinetic energy. In the initial state, will the skydiver have potential energy? Well, you bet, because I've defined the ground to be zero, so since the initial state is above the ground by height h, the skydiver will have gravitational potential energy there, mgh initial. All right, will the parachute, or will there be any external work that is being done? Well, there's no friction, but here we've um, described in the setup of the question that the parachute is going to be doing work uh, because it is supplying a force to the skydiver as he falls. So once again, we must remember that the displacement of the skydiver is downwards, but the force that the parachute is exerting is upwards. It's a slowing force. So since force is the opposite direction as displacement, this means that the work done is negative. 
So we need to have a minus sign here. And we recall that work is the force applied times the distance over which the force is applied. But in this case, the parachute is being applied all the way down from the initial to the final state. So the displacement of the skydiver in this case is legitimately the height that he falls. And that'll be nice because it means that these two terms uh, are the same and they carry the same height. Okay, we are done. We have set up our energy conservation equation. I have accounted for all the terms in the initials and final states. What is the question asking for? The question is asking for this. What is the final velocity? What is his speed at which he hits the ground? Uh, so let's see. This entire right-hand side we know, so let's just go ahead and start filling in some numbers here. Uh, let me remind myself what they were. Let's see, we have an 80 kilogram skydiver. He's moving at 30 meters per second initially. Don't forget to square that. Uh, 300 meters above the ground. Uh, the parachute is supplying a 100 Newton force that is acting for the entire 300 meter distance. All right, uh, let's see. Let's plug some things in and see what we get there. All right, so 1 half times 80 times 30 squared plus his gravitational potential, which is 80 times 9.8 times his height, which is going to be 300 meters. I then subtract off the work done by the parachute, which is going to be 100 times 300. And I'm left with the total of, yikes, he's going to hit the ground oh, pretty hard. Uh, I find, let's see, 241,200 joules of energy. All right, this of course is equal to 1 half m v final squared. Last thing I need to do is solve for this piece. So I get that v final is equal to 2 times this value, 241, 200 joules, divided by the mass. And then don't forget to take the square root of the entire thing. Let's see what we find. Times 2 divided by the mass. Holy cow, take the square root. And this poor skydiver is going to hit the ground at, oh, interesting, 77. 0.7 meters per second. All right, you do not survive that. So this is, um, this is like what, uh, 110, 120 miles an hour, something like that. So this is actually a little bit faster than terminal velocity. So if we'd included air resistance in this question, uh, the terminal velocity for a standard skydiver, I think is on the order of, oh man, like 90 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, something like that. So this is actually faster than terminal velocity, but includes the idea that we're not um, considering air resistance in the problem. Okay, so then we're done. That's it. How fast is he moving when he hits the ground? Bam, that's the question right there. So let me go back to uh, sharing. And let's look at the second piece of this question, which is instead of hitting the ground, suppose he falls onto a trampoline with a given spring constant of 5,000 newtons per meter. So let me write this down here. We have a spring constant. 5,000 newtons per meter. And assuming, sorry, this thing, you know, assuming the trampoline could stretch as far as it could possibly want to, maybe the trampoline's over, I don't know, a hole or something like that. Um, how far would the fabric stretch? Okay, so here's our new spring constant. So essentially all I'm doing here is now I'm adding a trampoline at the final state, and he's gonna hit the trampoline and it's going to stretch. And the question is essentially how far is that trampoline going to stretch? And assume, you know, maybe again, it's built over a hole or something so it can stretch as far as it wants to. So let's think smartly about this. The addition of the trampoline has done what to our system or has done what to our expression of energy? Has the addition of the trampoline affected the initial state of the skydiver at all? Or has it affected his motion from the initial to the final state? No, it hasn't. So our entire setup of the initial state plus the work done during the initial to the final state is still the same. So this number here on the right-hand side of the equation is still the same because I have not affected the initial state. I have not affected the motion from the initial to the final state. What have I added? I've added a trampoline. What does this add to our understanding of energy? Well, it now adds a term in our potential energy, which is the potential energy due to a compressed 
spring. And we'll assume this trampoline behaves like a spring so that we can use the spring energy equation. All right, so all this does now to our analysis is it adds a second term to the final energy expression, which is the spring's energy. So one half mv final squared plus one half kx squared is equal to 241 200 joules. All right, let's assume here uh, that, well, a couple of things. Let's assume that um, his final speed is the same as it was before, right before it hits the trampoline. And let's assume um, that there is going to be compression of the trampoline, but it's not really going to affect his height. If we were, if we were being really, really careful about this, I would say that the compression of this trampoline would add an extra gravitational term, because if it's being compressed a distance x below the point we have defined as h equals zero, I really would need another term in here, which is the distance of the compression of this trampoline. It would really be another minus mgx, another gravitational potential term, all right? But to simplify just a little bit, let's assume this is not going to be very big, and let's focus just solely, in this case, on the trampoline, all right? So we do this here, and in a sense, I'm done with the setup. Here is my energy expression. I know all the terms in here with the exception of the compression. All right, actually, well, let's see, can this be done? Because um, this is going to give a term that is essentially the same as this. So we'd really want then, ah, so we'd really want then to say, well, if he's moving this fast, and then compresses the trampoline. Let's in fact simplify to say that he's moving this quickly, one half mv squared. And let's say that at this point, the entirety of his energy is going to go into the compression of the trampoline. And again, if you wanted to be really, really careful about this, you could add an extra term, which is um, the fact that his vertical displacement would be a little bit below the line that we have defined as h equals zero. So if you really, really want to be careful, we would include this term. This would require, unfortunately, uh, solving a quadratic equation from this. So let's assume this is small, and let's just solve this assuming that all the kinetic energy is being transferred purely into the potential energy of the trampoline. If we do that, what do we get in that case? Let's see, 241, 200. It's just an enormous amount of energy. Um, so all of that, that 241,200 is going purely into the compression of the trampoline. So I multiply by two. I divide by the spring constant, 5,000. Then I take the square root of the final answer. And we get here, yeah, something a little bit absurd. Uh, that's what I get for not checking the, <laughs> the, checking the numbers beforehand. I found a 9.8 meter displacement. All right. And that's okay. So with this, so this again is assuming that when he hits the ground here, the final position, his final velocity is being converted purely into gravitational potential energy. Since we find here that the compression of the trampoline would actually be pretty big, you'd have to have a hole uh, underneath it um, really to be able to um, have the trampoline flex uh, by that amount. Um, it might be worthwhile to include um, a final term that indicates that you are indeed below the line of h equals zero and have defined um, gravitational potential energy to be included in the system. All right, so from this, again, I want you to notice that the setup of the expression and the really just the procedure for going through this is the same for all these questions. I mean, after you define this system, you just check where the various uh, parts of energy occur. You just check whether or not you have those different forms. And a lot of times, well, number one, the equations are going to look um, very, very similar to with respect to each other. But if there's a question like this or like the roller coaster question previously, which has the same initial state, then the setup for that initial state is going to look very, very much the same. And in fact, you can use that um, to solve multiple pieces of the same question. All right, so not to happy with how the trampoline turned out, but uh, 
I hope the first part of the question made a lot more sense. This is much more like what you're going to see in class. The translation ended up being a little bit more complicated than I had hoped, but uh, this is all right. Okay, let's go back to here. And let's move on to our third question. All right, oh, we have another diver. But in this case, it's gonna be in the context of a collegiate diver who is actually intending uh, to dive into the water. So again, as usual, take a read through this question. Uh, write out the first uh, couple steps and the setup for this question. Go ahead and take a stab at solving the question, if you'd like, and resume the video when you're ready. We'll come back and solve the question together. In the meantime, I'm gonna have some coffee. All right, coffee is excellent. Okay, let's see here. Uh, 50 kilogram diver uh, from a 10 meter platform, launches off the platform with some speed. I say nearly vertically um, so that she's not going to hit the platform on the way down. I don't wanna have to worry about that particular complication. Um, when she enters the water, it supplies a constant force of 3000 Newtons. And the question then is, uh, how far below the surface of the water will she come to rest? This is a really interesting question um, that a lot of individuals who are doing excuse me, like mechanical engineering, for instance, need to consider how deep do I need to make the pool such that these divers, when they dive in the pool, uh, are able to have enough time uh, to be able to come to rest before um, hitting the bottom of the pool. So once again, make sure you've written everything down. I'm gonna stop sharing so that you can see my webcam. All right, and let's look at this problem together. Here we go. So here's some water, draw a picture. All right, just again, you know, assume this is water. Okay, here's my diving platform. And here's the individual. On the diving platform, and she's happy because um, unlike our skydiver, she is uh, not gonna die when she falls into the water. Uh, let's see, let's define the coordinate system. Nothing special. X and Y coordinates. Uh, let's see, let's write some things down that were given in the problem. So we're told a uh, 50 kilogram diver, she's 10 meters above the pool. She's gonna hop off with an initial speed of four meters per second. And note here that this is one of the beauty, beautiful things of the um, energy approach, is that we don't have to deal with vectors. It doesn't matter in what direction she is jumping, but what matters is that she is jumping with four meters per second of velocity. So that will then give us her initial kinetic energy. Uh, she's going to enter the water. The water is going to supply a force of 3,000 newtons. After she hits the water, she's going to fall a certain distance into it. Let's call that distance D. And she's going to come to rest. Okay. Um, let's do a bit of a non-standard definition here. Let's call the surface of the water. This is going to be our zero point for gravitational potential energy. All right, let's see, define my zero point. Next thing is to define the initial and final states. So let's call the final state all the way down here when she comes to rest uh, after hitting the water. And the initial state is right when she jumps off the diving board with this initial speed of four meters per second. Okay, and what is the question asking for? How far below the surface of the water? So the question is asking us for this. What is the depth uh, in the water? All right, this, we're gonna solve this with conservation of energy. So let's set up our conservation of energy equation. Energy initial plus external work. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next step, which is to write this out in terms of its specific energies. So kinetic final plus potential final equals kinetic initial plus potential initial plus external work. All right, and Let's just start filling things in. Uh, let's go left to right, just uh, for a lack of creativity. So in her final state, so she falls into the water, um, uh, coasts for a little bit as the water forces her to come to rest, and then at the final state here, she's at rest, okay? So at this state, does she have any kinetic energy? No, she doesn't, because at that point, she has come to rest in the water. Will she have potential energy? Yes, she will, but here we need to be careful. I've defined 
my h equals zero to be this line here. And remember, gravitational potential energy works such that the direction that we've defined as upward is positive. So all these values up here are positive values for the gravitational potential energy. All the values down in this domain are negative values for the gravitational potential energy. So she does have gravitational potential energy here because she is off of the line we've defined as h equals zero, but because she is below it, it must accrue a minus sign. So this term is going to become a minus mgd, where d, of course, is her depth below the surface. Okay, let's keep checking terms here. Let's see. Uh, here's her initial state. She's gonna jump off the diving board. Uh, will there be kinetic energy? in this state? Absolutely, because she's jumping off with some speed. So there'll be one half m the initial squared. Will she have potential energy at this point? Yes, because she is a height 10 meters above the line we have defined as h equals zero. Again, keep in mind because she is above this point, she will have positive values of potential energy. So plus mgh initial. All right. Is there going to be external work that is done? Yes, because as she falls through the water, the water constantly exerts a force on her to slow her down. So once again, we have to remember the displacement as she falls into the water is downwards, but the force that the water is supplying to her is upwards. This means that the work that is going to be done is negative by nature. So this is going to be negative, the force supplied by the water times the distance over which the force is supplied. Remember, we've defined this distance that she falls into the water or falls through the water, more specifically as d. All right, so look at this, we're almost done. We've checked the initial and final state. We've checked if there's external work done. Now, what is the question asking us to find? Well, the question wants us to find this right here. What is the value of d? So, uh, I'm gonna take this term, move it over to the other side. So I am going to get, let's see, plus. So I'll get force of water minus mg times d equals one half m the initial squared plus mgh initial. Uh, all these terms I know, let's plug some things in. Let's see, 50 kilogram person. She's initially moving at four meters per second. Uh, the initial height is 10 meters above the ground. So let's go ahead and plug numbers in here. Let's see, what do we get? One half times 50 times four times four, plus the mass, which is 50 times 9.8 times the height, which is 10, gives me a total of 5,300 joules of energy. All right, uh, the thing I'm looking for here is this value of D. I'd go ahead and solve for that. So that's going to give me that D is this number, 5,300 joules of energy, divided by the force supplied by the water minus this term mg. Let's see what we get here. Let's see. What was the force of the water? It's 3,000 newtons minus m times g, 50 times 9.8. And then I do 5,300 divided by that value. So I find that the total distance that she plunges through the water is 2.1 meters. All right, so when you're building uh, your pool with your 10 meter diving platform, you need to make sure that assuming uh, that you know, your pool is filled with water, that your pool must be at least 2.1 meters deep to give the individuals enough time to be able to come to rest after hitting the water at speed. Now, I want you to notice once again from this that the energy conservation approach only cares about the initial state, the final state, and any non-conservative work that is being done on the way. What I see a lot of students, if we gave this problem to you uh, as a homework problem, what I would see a lot of students doing is saying, okay, this is gonna be my initial state. My final state will be when she hits the water. That will then become my new initial state, such that my new final state becomes when she comes to rest, all right? And I hope you notice from this energy approach that you don't need to do this. 
all right? Energy doesn't care about what you're doing in the intermediary, all right? If the problem had asked, what speed does she hit the water, then yes, I would make this my final state when she hits the water, all right? But because the problem didn't ask for that, I'm gonna jump immediately to how fast, um, uh, how deep does she immerse in the water before coming to rest? And I don't even have to worry about what happens when she hits the water because the energy approach will take care of all of that motion as long as we are careful uh, and not forgetting to include any external work that is done through the points that we have defined as initial and final. All right, nicely done on problem three. I've got three more problems for us to go through. So let me go ahead and share the screen. Okay, let's move on to the next question. All right, slamming on the brakes. All right, as before, read this question, set it up for yourself, move through the first couple of setup steps. Um, when you are ready to hear me talk through the solution, go ahead and resume the video. All right, got me some coffee. Excellent, so we need to be Fairly careful with our setup of this question. The um, height, the gravitational potential energy um, is going to be the tricky thing uh, to figure out for this question. So let's do so here. I'm gonna draw this out nice, nice and big. Again, forgive my lack of artistic acumen. This is not to scale, absolutely not to scale. Um, we got a five degree angle here. All right, here's the car. I'm going to assume this is the initial state of the car. Set up my coordinate system. Nothing fancy here. Important thing being that y uh, is upwards, such that uh, gravitational potential energy is also positive in the upward direction. Uh, let's see here, what do we know? It is a 1500 kilogram car. The initial speed is 20 meters per second. So I'm gonna make that my initial point up here. Uh, five degree slope, you slam on the brakes. So let's say from here to here, the brakes are gonna be exerting a friction force. All right, and that friction force is going to be 12,000 Newtons. And you're going to skid this distance here that you've skidded, let's call it a distance D. All right. Let's see, friction fourth is 12,000. Um, what is the question asking for? How far do you skid? So the question is asking for this right here. So let's say at this point here, I'm gonna define this as my final state. And let's say at this point you've come to rest. All right, so you've slammed on your brakes and you've come to rest at that point. All right, last thing I need to do again is define where is my gravitational potential energy going to be zero? Now, you could define it to be the bottom of the triangle, and that would be perfectly fine. But again, I'm gonna use my uh, uh, experience of 10,000 hours and the fact that I've solved lots and lots and lots of these problems to give you a different suggestion, which is I suggest that you make this point right here, the h equals zero. And I do this because if I define my h equals zero here, when the car gets to this point, it's going to be on the h equals zero line, which means it's not going to have any gravitational potential energy. So I'm in a sense, uh, and this, you, you saw this when we did torque, right? You picked a pivot point and torque to ignore uh, one of the forces. Here I'm choosing my zero line to ignore one of the energies, if you like. Okay, uh, let's see, we're gonna have to set up some trig here, but we'll do that in just a little bit. So let's set up our energy equation. energy initial plus external work. All right, let's write this out fully in the context of all the different types of energies. Kinetic final plus potential final equals kinetic initial plus potential initial. This is gonna be the tricky one to figure out. Plus any external work that is being done. All right, let's check these points. Uh, I have defined the final state to be the point where the car comes to rest. So at this point, is there any kinetic energy? No, 
there isn't, because the car has come to rest. At this point, is there any gravitational potential energy? No, there isn't, because I have defined it to be that way. So look at this. The left-hand side of the equation is zero. It's kind of fun. All right. Let's check the other side. Um, is the car initially in motion? Let's double check. Yes, it is. It's moving at 20 meters per second. So there is some initial kinetic energy. Is there any initial potential energy? Ooh, this is the tricky one to figure out because remember, potential energy is vertical. So when I write it as mg height initial, the height initial is going to be referring to this distance here. This is my height h. All right, so here you need to be a little bit clever about using some trick. So if this is the height h, is one side of the triangle. Here's another side of the triangle, and here we're given an angle. So in a sense, this triangle reduces to this one here, where I have that the car is gonna slide a distance d down the ramp. It'll go through a vertical distance h, given this angle of five degrees. So how do I connect these three together? Well, remember, um, the side of the triangle that does not touch the angle is the cosine. So I have here that cosine of five degrees is equal to h over d, which means that my initial height um, that the car is going to be moving through for my gravitational potential energy is going to be d times the cosine of five degrees. All right, so that's going to go in here. I'm going to rewrite my equation down here. 0 equals 1 half m v initial squared plus mg times the initial height, which we determined was d times the cosine of phi. Okay. Last piece we need is, is there any external work done? Absolutely, because the uh, brakes are supplying friction. Once again, we need to remember here that the displacement of the car is down the incline but the force, the friction force that is acting is up the incline, the opposite direction. This means that the work done here is negative. So I'm going to have minus the force of friction times the distance over which friction is acting. And remember, we define that distance as d. Luckily enough, is also what we're solving for. All right. So here, in a sense, we're done. Uh, here's my conservation of energy equation. What am I solving for? The problem would like me to find this distance d, that the car slides down the incline. Uh, let's see, so I'm gonna simplify just a little bit here. Uh, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get zero equals, uh, I'll go ahead and plug in numbers at this point. So what do I get? Uh, one half mv squared, 0 0.5 times 1500 kilogram car, moving at 20 meters per second is going to be 300,000, joules. Let's see. Mg times cosine of 5. Let's see. What's the car? 1,500 kilogram car times 9.8 times the cosine of 5. Make sure my calculator is in degrees. And I get here, let's see, 14,644.1. And then I still have this value of d that's kicking around. And then minus, what do I have? 12,000 times, once again, this distance d. All right, uh, let's see. I think we're done here. Let's just solve for d. What do we get? Uh, let's see. I'm going to go 300,000, 14, 644 is mg times cosine of 5. That yep, looks good. Minus. 12,000, and so you get 300,000 divided by 2644, and I get pretty long distance here, about 113 meters. All right, let's see. So once again, I want to point out that look at the setup. I mean, this, this equational setup here is 
exactly the same, where I define my initial and final states, I set up my energies, and I look for all of these terms. All right. Oh, let me see here. Um, this looks right. Oh, I might have dropped. I might have dropped a minus sign. Let me check the setup to that question. Um, let's see here. Ah, yes, that's what it should have been. Yes, 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 yes. That is my fault. So this should have been. Where was it? Aha, this one here. I missed a zero. Easy fix. So this is going to be supplying one hundred and twenty thousand newtons. That makes much more sense. All right. So this is applying 120,000. So that's going to make this then. Hundred twenty thousand times D. That's much, much better. That's much better. That's this is what I get for doing these live. All right. So I get 14. That's that looks much better. 644. I was like, where'd this minus sign come from? 0 0.1 minus 120,000. And then it's 300,000. Minus 300,000 divided by this minus value, that looks much better. So now we're getting, yeah, much better. Now a distance of about 2.85 meters. Pretty damn fast, but uh, 120,000 newtons of force is pretty damn good on the brakes. All right, give you a chance once more. Here's my setup. Here's my solution. Again, with that fixed value. I was wondering why I was running into a minus sign uh, for D. I was like, you really shouldn't be getting a negative sign for D, and that would be why. My number for friction was incorrect. Let me fix that just really quick here. And done. Uh, all right, so I hope even from that, uh, you notice even if, uh, as I screwed up one of the numbers uh, and writing it down, as long as you have your setup correct for the question, literally all you need to do is just plug in what the new number is. And you just keep the equational form the same through the whole question. All right, next question. All right, I've got two more for us to go through. Here's the next one. Let me get it set up here. Okay, so as usual, uh, set up the question, go through uh, each of those individual steps to define your system, uh, set things up correctly. When you are ready, go ahead and resume the video and we'll talk about this one together. Oh, this is one where you're going to need uh, momentum for this guy, that's kind of fun. And it uh, has variables too, in this case, we're not gonna be able to plug in numbers, our answer is going to be a variable, which is perfectly fine. All right, let's go back here. Okay, let's draw out the question. So I got a big package down here, 2M, got a package up here, I'm gonna call it capital M. Uh, let's see, this is a three meter vertical distance and this package is going to slide, slam into this one and these two are going to fly off at some speed. And the question was, what is that speed? Okay, set up the coordinate system. Notice how I'm going through these steps a little bit quicker now that you've had some practice. Here's my initial state. Uh, the final state is going to be the moment the collision occurs. And then um, to find out if you like the effect of the collision, we are going to have to use conservation of momentum when we get there, which is perfectly fine. Nothing special with the system. I'm gonna have it be the mass that is sliding down the incline, and the Earth, once again, because I want to uh, present potential energies as opposed to doing external work. So I'll put the Earth in the system so I can write things as potential energies. Start with our energy conservation formula. E final equals E initial plus external work. There we are. All right, let's write this out in terms of its kinetic, oh, I forgot one thing, where's our H equals zero? Again, nothing special. Let's define the base of the ramp. As our H equals zero. Okay, let's write out each of these terms. Kinetic final plus potential final equals kinetic initial plus potential initial 
plus any external work that's being done. And before, let's go from left to right. Uh, will this box be in motion when it collides with this box? You betcha, so that's gonna be a one half m v squared. Uh, does the box at this point have any potential energy? Well, no, it doesn't, because again, I've defined uh, that point to be zero. All the way up here, when the box is in its initial state, will it have any kinetic energy? Let's double check the question. Uh, it says the package here of mass m is released from rest, which means its initial velocity is zero, which means there is no kinetic energy in its initial state. Will there be potential energy here? Well, you betcha, because it's a height above where I've defined my h equals zero, so there's going to be an mgh that's going to appear here. Is there any external work? Well, I put the Earth in the system, so there's no external work there. So any external work here would be due to um, friction or air resistance or anything like that, and there's none of that in the system. There's no friction, there's no air resistance, so this is a nice question where there is no external work that's being done. All right, so I need to find here, what is the speed of this mass right before it makes the collision? with the second mass, all right? And notice a little cool thing that happens. Because there's no external work done, the masses will cancel. And this is what you'll see from a lot of energy perspectives, is that the mass of the object, as long as there's no external work, uh, doesn't matter. This is one of the things that, of course, um, Galileo was able, to, or, uh, was able to prove um, when he dropped, or not Galileo, um, uh, my mind is drawing a blank. The individual who dropped the two different uh, mass spheres from the Eiffel Tower, and they accelerated at the same rate. And this is a consequence of sort of why. So what do we get here? This simplifies nicely. 2v equals the square root of 2gh. All right. And this I know, because I'm given the height of 3 meters. So I can plug in numbers at this point. Let's go ahead and do it. 2 times 9.8 times 3 takes square root. And I end up with, let's see, square root 7.7 .7 meters per second. Okay. We're only halfway there because, again, this is the speed that uh, this block is going to collide into the second one. And the question is, um, what is the speed that the two blocks will be exiting the collision together? So we have to appeal to conservation of momentum. And remember, during conservation of momentum, the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. So the initial momentum of the blocks will equal their final combined momentum at their new final speed. And again, this is what the problem was, which is what is the new speed after the two blocks have collided and stick together? Well, the second block is initially at rest, so it has no initial momentum. Uh, we're given the speed of the first block and its mass, so I can sort of write this in as uh, let's go ahead and write it as 7.7 .7 times m. This will be equal to the final, which is the two added masses. Uh, so I'm going to have m plus 2m is going to give 3m times the final speed of the two blocks combined. So here nicely, once again, Notice that a mass term appears on both sides of the equation. So I can solve this problem without even knowing what the masses of the blocks are. Because a lot of times in energy and momentum relationships, um, the mass is going to appear everywhere, uh, which means it will cancel, which is kind of fun. All right, last little step, find our final velocity, nice and easy. We find 2 point, uh, we'll just go to 1, 2.6 meters per second. All right. And notice here how I picked this problem specifically where we set up the pre-collision using the energy approach and then used the result of the energy approach to help understand the behavior of the collision using now a momentum approach. And notice again, the setup is still the same. I don't care how the mass got from here to here. I only care where it started and where it finished. This is, again, the beauty of the energy approach. I'm not dealing with vectors. I'm not dealing with directions a lot of the time, as opposed from, you know, above the h equals zero line is positive and below it is negative and, and so on and so forth. All right, so it's just a really uh, 
elegant solution method. And I hope that the more practice that you get with these, you know, the quicker you'll be able to go through these first couple of steps. And really all energy problems are just kind of filling in this equation right here, just identifying all the pieces of energy, writing out one equation, and then solve it. I'd leave this up for just a second. I've got one more problem for us to go through. All right. Here it is, back on the theme of the amusement parks. All right, as before, read through this question, set up the problem for yourself, just like you'd be solving this, uh, like a homework question or an exam question. Move through some of the pieces, and I'm gonna take a sip of coffee, uh, resume the video when you're ready to look at the solution together. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, frictionless tube, uh, top of the slide is three meters above the bottom. Um, let's see, horizontal distance, so they hit the water, and it's 1.2 meters above the swimming pool. So here we're going to need to appeal to a little bit of kinematics to help us solve the question, uh, which is why I picked this one on purpose. We'll solve part of it with energy, and then we'll have to solve the rest with uh, kinematics, which is kind of fun. All right, let's go back here. All right, let's set up the question. Uh, let's see, so here is my slide. You drop off the slide, you hit the water. We're told this is a 1.2 meter distance. We're told this is a three meter distance. Let's see, do they start from rest? I'm pretty sure they do. Uh, doesn't say, so let's assume they start at rest. Perfectly good assumption to make, given what I understand uh, about water slides. And they're gonna shoot out of here horizontally. And the question is, let's see, what horizontal distance do they make? So we're essentially asking for this distance here. All right, this horizontal distance before they hit the water. Again, very important for amusement park manufacturers is you need to give uh, all of your individuals enough space um, to be able to fly off of this slide and hit the water um, so that they don't hit, you know, concrete and break bones and sue your water park and so on and so forth. Okay, a couple of things to set up. Let's see, here's my coordinate system. I'm gonna define the bottom of the slide here. To be my point of h equals zero, I'll show you why as we go through here. Uh, let's see, the top of the slide is gonna be the initial state. The bottom of the slide is gonna be the final state. And then to understand the pool, we're gonna have to use kinematics to do that. Um, because energy does not handle horizontal distances very well. Really for uh, horizontal distances, you need to use um, kinematics of some kind to help you out. So we'll have to appeal to that. Um, and we'll start with the energy conservation equation. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and write this out in more detail. We'll start filling in pieces. So let's see, I'll do it down here. Let's work external. Okay, so remember here that I'm using the energy approach simply to understand what's going on with the slide. Um, for the piece with the pool, we're gonna have to use kinematics. So we're gonna focus just now on the slide. I want to know how fast is the person leaving the slide. All right, so let's go through our energy checks. Uh, is the slide presenting any external work? Nope, because it is frictionless. Uh, let's check the final point I've defined potential energy to be zero there, but there will be some speed. They are gonna exit the slide with some speed. So we'll need that here. And let's see, now with the initial point up here, they start at rest, which means there's no initial kinetic energy, but they start a height above where we have defined H equals zero, so there will be some gravitational potential energy. MGH emission. All right, and again, notice, you should hope, hopefully notice that this is familiar. I mean, it's a different context and a different problem, but in this energy approach, um, the equational setup is nearly identically the same as the same problem, really quite fun. Um, okay, let's see, masses cancel, and we get that the speed exiting that slide is the square root of 2GH. We know all of these, let's plug some things in. 
Let's see, 2 times g times h, take the square root, and I get 7.7 .7 years per second. Okay, now, we're, now it's time we have to think about kinematics a little bit, because this is 7.7 .7 meters exiting the slide in a horizontal direction, which, now if I'm going to be more particular about it, this means that the x component of that person's velocity is 7.7 .7 meters per second, and they are not accelerating in the x direction. Conversely, their y component of their velocity is zero, but they are accelerating in the y direction due to gravity. So this is a standard trick um, to con connect these two directions, is you use the um, distance given in the y direction to determine the time it takes for you to fall in the y direction, and then use that time to understand the distance that you traveled in the x direction, since the timing is the same between both of these. Now, since there's no initial velocity in the y direction, my y distance is sim excuse me, simply going to be 1 half times my acceleration times my time squared. You should hopefully remember this from kinematics if your initial velocity is 0. This means I can solve for the time, given that I know what the vertical distance is of 1.2 meters and my acceleration of 9.8. Let's see what we find. Uh, it's going to be 1.2 meters times 2 divided by 9.8, and then take the square root. It's going to be pretty quick. Yeah, pretty quick here. So the time to hit the water is, let's go ahead and round it, is half a second. All right, and this just makes sense, given your experience coming out of a water slide. You hit the water pretty quick. All right. Now, as before, the time that you travel in the y direction is the same time that you travel in the x direction. But the nice thing about there being no acceleration in the x direction means that the distance that you travel in the x direction is simply going to be your velocity times your time. We know these 7.7 .7 meters per second in the x direction times the time of half a second to hit the water means, and here's our final answer, 7.7 .7 divided by 2 is going to give us 3.85 meters. So it doesn't take you very long to fall, but because the entirety of your velocity that you get from energy conservation is purely in the x direction, even though it's not taking you a lot of time to smack the water, you're going to fly out a pretty significant distance before you do. All right. So that was all six of the questions that I have prepared. Let me just double check here. Yes, that is all six of the questions that I had prepared for today. So make sure that you finish up uh, the grade scope assignment. Just essentially go in and claim that uh, I was the one um, giving this lecture, uh, particularly since this is probably a bit of a lengthy lecture. If you want to jump around a little bit and just kind of head toward the solutions to make sure you did things correctly, of course, that is um, perfectly fine. Um, if you would like to do something like that. So uh, with that being said, I hope that will give you um, plenty enough of practice uh, in using the conservation of energy equation that you'll be able to now jump into studio to get some more practice with some of these problems. And at the end of the day, I really hope you notice that it is a uh, real samey procedure between all of these, where it's really just the same form of the expression and the same way that you pick out the initial and final states and define where your gravitational potential energy is zero. The only difference being uh, the context of the problem fills in those different energy types a little bit differently. All right, if you have any questions on these, of course, you're more than welcome to ask during the morning Q and A's. Otherwise, uh, thank you for watching. I hope this helped give you a little bit more practice with energy conservation and best of luck as you mosey into the studio either later today or whenever you are watching this particular video.